I'd like to welcome everybody to this session celebrating the centenary of the Baha'i Faith in Australia. And in this session and the one that follows it, we pay tribute to pioneers in this country. The question arises, who is a pioneer? Of course, it's any Baha'i who makes a conscious decision to change their place of living uh, for another place that uh, is um, a, an opportunity for them to spread knowledge of Baha'u'llah's coming and the teachings that he has brought for the betterment of the world. But what types of pioneers do we have? When Jack and I were living in Papua New Guinea, our much loved counselor, Sarus Naraki, often said that there are conditional pioneers and unconditional pioneers. And of course, meant that there are those pioneers who are in their areas of service so long as certain conditions are met. Mm. Pioneers who are unconditional and they are there no matter what. <laughs> Whatever the tribulations, whether they remain happy or joyous or miserable, whether they're ineffective or effective, or whether they're blessed or stressed. But how many pioneers have entered the field from the Australian Baha'i community? I don't think anybody knows. It's not been tabulated. But I'm quite sure that if we were to add up the number of Australian Baha'is who have pioneered on the home front or internationally from the 1930s through to the current time, it would be in the thousands. Now, in the centenary year, who is most likely to understand the legacy of Clara and Hyde Dunn at our 100 year point? Who's most likely to understand the certain uncertainties that the Dunn's experienced? The distance, the heat, the inconveniences, the isolation. It's the pioneers. Who's most likely to be in touch with Indigenous Australia and Australia's harsh environment? It's the pioneers. And so today we have a chance to catch just a glimpse of what the pioneers have experienced and what they can tell us. And we recognize that these sessions are just a drop in uh, the ocean of uh, experience that uh, we hope that they can unfold to us in future sessions. Let this session be just the beginning of our listening to the pioneer experience. And so for today's session, I've asked uh, to uh, assist with the first hour and Stephen Mossy Jones, John's help with the second hour. And I'll just briefly introduce Helen. Helen, born in Victoria, but raised in Perth, where she became a Baha'i about 1967. And since 1970, she's been a, a pioneer in different places in Western Australia. And I first encountered Helen with her work at editing Bush Honey, one of the, one of the magazines that she edited. And uh, she seemed the most appropriate person to help us get in touch with uh, the experience of the pioneers uh, in Western Australia. Helen, thanks for coming online today. I'm going to uh, hand over to you now uh, for your presentation. We look forward to hearing from you and those friends you brought online with you today. Okay. All right. So I, I'll just talk and <laughs> I'll just start talking. I'll, I'll do my PowerPoint shortly, Graham, but I'll start off by talking. Is that okay? That's all okay? Good. Okay. That's fine. All right. Well, I'd like to start, since this is celebrating the, the time when of uh, mother and father done when they came to Australia, is that um, the first uh, Baha'is in Perth were Annie and William Miller, and they um, heard about the faith. Uh, I think it was uh, got it written here. Um, it was in. Sorry, I got my <laughs> trying to skip through this so it doesn't go too long. Um, Anyway, it was just after uh, their first trip it was mother and father Dunn came here the first time. I think it was in 1922 or 23. And uh, they held a meeting 
And Annie and William Miller had, Annie had been, actually been friends of John Esselman in Scotland before they came to Australia. So when they saw that this meeting was being held, they'd heard that he'd become a Baha'i. So they thought they should investigate. And so they um, went to the meeting and they became the first Baha'is in Perth. Um, so uh, they, they had many meetings there uh, and eventually, uh, I don't know quite when, but the first local assembly of Perth was formed not that long after that. Um, it, it, of course, after a while it lapsed and for a long time, Annie and um, William were the only Baha'is in Perth for quite some time. But their daughter, uh, who's uh, known as, well, her name was Mary, but she was known as Maisie, she married Anthony Chin, and she was the first pioneer to Harvey. So she went down to, this was in ninth, uh, let's see, um, my dates. <laughs> um, they went to Harvey, uh, they were on a small dairy farm in Harvey, in 1933, they went to Harvey. They lived on a, a dairy farm with no electricity milking 20 cows by hand every day. <laughs> and she used to hold behind meetings, public meetings in the Harvey Hall. And this is how uh, Roger Ridley and Sylvia Chidlow became Baha'is. They heard about it through Maisie. So this was the beginning of pioneering in, well, uh, the south of Western Australia anyway. Um, so, uh, I'll go on uh, to myself. Um, my connection with the faith came from going to firesides at John and Margaret Hanley's house. Uh, and I first heard about that in 1967 from a friend of mine called Verona Lucas. I see you there, Alan, <laughs> Alan Major. <laughs> Hi, Alan. <laughs> and um, she, it was her that told me about it and dragged me along to these firesides. And uh, in 1970, I declared, I became a Baha'i. Um, yeah. And there were just a handful of us in that, those days. <laughs> there was, um, I remember Fiona MacDonald and Barbara and Charlie Pierce. Um, and we were all quite um, very active Baha'i youth. We had our own singing group. We used to travel around. We used to travel, teach to all the country towns, going to all the agricultural shows and putting on displays. And... Um, and then the call, we were only like one LSA in Perth when the call came for Pioneers to the Pacific. And so uh, five members of our group went to the Pacific. It was Otley Stremple, um, Meg and Tony Dima, Charlie and Barbara Pierce all left and went to Vanuatu. Uh, so that was the first sort of pioneering uh, people taking off, but that was to the um, internationally to Vanuatu. And of course, Tony's still there and he's now um, got his own airline, Unity Airlines, and he's got the Earth is but one country and mankind its citizens written across the side of every aeroplane. <laughs> so, and this flies around. No wonder Tano's going to have a temple. <laughs> um, so um, after a couple of years in Perth, um, there, there by then there were three assemblies, I think South Perth and Subiaco as well. Um, I left uh, because my friend Maxine had, um, whom I'd been flatting with and who was very interested in the faith also, had left, also gone traveling and she was getting married in Ireland to Jim Bradley. So I took off to go to her wedding. And in the process, um, I wandered up to Scotland where I'd always wanted to go and there I met my husband, Don, and we got married in Scotland. So our first, uh, our married, first year of our married life was spent living with gypsies on a, um, uh, the very first legalised gypsy caravan site in Scotland. So we were just there for a year and then I got pregnant and Don was offered a job back in Australia and we thought maybe it's time to, to move back. So this began, we went from Scotland to Laverton. If anyone knows where Laverton is, it's right in the very middle of the desert in Western Australia. <laughs> so Don was to be the social worker there. 
And uh, so literally we just went straight there and all we had with us was, uh, we carried on the plane, everything we owned. And that was just a, a, a carry bag and, and one case that we put on the plane. And that was everything we had. <laughs> so we, it was very easy for us just to go out to Laverton. And, um, and then from Laverton, we went, um, I'll try and read this so I get a little bit, don't get mixed up. Um, yeah, so this went from Laverton and then we went, uh, that was in the goldfields, and then we went up to Derby and then uh, was followed by Kununurra. So five years were in the Kimberleys and Don was managing all the native welfare work up there. So all that time I was just, we were, I'd hold little stalls and I'd, um, you know, to, when there was a market day on, I'd have a little Baha'i stall. Uh, and sometimes I do interesting things like silk screening cards to attract people to come and look at my books <laughs> and, um, do, you know, just did what I could. Um, we held public meetings. Um, I think the most, uh, the best meeting we had was in Derby when Jackie Apiaspark was also up in the Kimberley. She was working as a teacher on Beverly Springs Station, which is even probably about 200 k's north of Derby, if you can imagine that. I'm going to show you a map shortly so you'll see where these places are. Um, and uh, we thought we'd have a public meeting. So we advertised it. We put these little posters up with Baha'i principles on, come to our meeting. And then we, we ha even had a little projector with a slideshow. And so we were all waiting um, for, you know, people to come and nobody came. And then about half an hour later, we we're just about thinking we should pack up. And in walked this, uh, yeah, a man, who Father Daniels was his name. He was a, a Trappist monk and he was living on an Indigenous community called One Arm Point. And so he, um, he came in and immediately he just picked up, started reading the Baha'i books. We started talking to him about the faith. He said, this man is a prophet. He, he just accepted the faith straight away. He walked out with, after we'd had a long conversation, he walked out with gleanings, which he understood very well. He had no trouble reading that and many other Baha'i books. And for probably about three years afterwards, he didn't actually sign a card to become a Baha'i, but he, he still stayed in the church. But we had three years we were corresponding with him afterwards and talking to him, you know, about different issues. Um, so that was, that was the, the highlight of my teaching experience in Derby. <laughs> Um, so yeah, there was a lot of interesting people that we, you know, the like-minded people, I suppose, that we, um, came in touch with. And also I have to say for my husband, my husband was not a Baha'i, my husband Don, but he was a social worker. And in those days he was the first trained social worker in Western Australia. So he was the first lot of social workers to go through UWA and train as a social worker. And in those days, social work was like a religion. You know, it was like, you know, it was like you could transform the world through social theories. So Don was doing all his social theories while I was <laughs> looking after the children. And all our three children were born up in, in the Kimberleys. And um, so, you know, I was being a mother and teaching the faith wherever I could. And Don was out there full on doing his uh, work with the Indigenous people, like uh, helping with community issues and um, all the different problems that come up with uh, Indigenous people. So, um, yeah, so this was, this was our life. And, um, and then um, we were moved to Kununurra and the same thing, but all that time we were traveling, Don was traveling all the time through the Kimberley. So we were visiting all these towns, Fitzroy Crossing, Halls Creek, um, and became very familiar with uh, the Kimberley region. Um, so uh, after we'd been there for well, five years in the Kimberleys, we were starting to feel like we wanted to settle down and that we had three children. And so we decided to move south. So we chose Narragin as the place to go to um, because um, there was no Baha'is there, whereas there was already three families uh, had a, a group in Bunbury at that time. Um, so, um, yeah, 
just trying to think. So I think that that was 1979, we moved to Narragin. And so we moved from this tiny house that we were living in that was not air conditioned, if you can imagine living in a non air conditioned house in the Kimberleys. <laughs> it was not air conditioned, we just had fans and hopper windows. And then we moved to one of the coldest towns in Western Australia, which was Narragin, <laughs> which you get ice on the ground in the, in the winter. Um, so we lived in Narragin for 19 years and we saw the development of the faith progress over that time in the south of Western Australia. Now, before I go on, I know that Marshid, um, now that we've moved south, <laughs> I'm trying to cover so much stuff in such a short space of time. <laughs> so uh, please forgive me if I've left out a few things here and there. But if anyone wants any more detailed information about any of this, I have a stack of, uh, of detail about all these things and these places. So um, uh, please just contact me and I can give you information about your town or your area. Yeah. So, and Helen, Rashid, do you I'm going to show the map. Uh, I will. I will. I'll bring that up. Do you want me to bring that up now? Well, then people will know where she was. Okay. All right. I'll bring it up now. So we're into this, and then Mashid can take over. Okay. Yeah, and then, of course, once you've shown it, you can take that off, and we'll see Mashid speaking. Okay. You? All right. So, um, okay. Here we are. Uh, now, have I got my screen full, or what? Is, what am I doing? <laughs> is that right? Okay, all right. Now, if I bring that up, is that good? Is that okay, Graham? Yes. Um, he said this was he was the first Indigenous Baha'i in Australia. He said, for those who go first, there are no trails, no tracks, no roads to guide the way. They follow no path, and because they are first, the path, in fact, follows them. They leave behind the line of their footprints as they walk the earth towards the point they have chosen on the horizon. With each generation, the way is smoothed by those who have gone before. And because of them, there are no longer places so narrow that we must pass one by one. The way is worn wide enough for whole tribes and nations to tread the path together. So I thought that was so beautiful and I oh, thought it yes. was so much about pioneering. So here we can now have, this to me is the fruit of my life. <laughs> Three children and eight grandchildren who are all Baha'is. <laughs> so, and very active and my children have been pioneers as well. So don't think because your children grow up in an isolated place that they will never serve the faith because they haven't been in a community they follow your spirit <laughs> and my children have done that. So um, that's my recent picture of my family. <laughs> and that's the thing I'm most proud of. <laughs> so these are all the places. This is Western Australia. This is where we were, we were right up in the Kimberleys, that red region. Can you see that? Everyone follow that okay? Mm. Um, so we were in uh, Derby here and then we were in Kununurra. Uh, much later, we went up to other parts of the Kimberley, but I'll get back to that later. Um, and then we moved all the way down here to Narragin. <laughs> so now we, we talk to Mashid, and she is in Albany, which is right down the very south. So, <laughs> okay. So uh, Mashid is a long-time friend. We moved to uh, Narragin, and she moved to Albany, and... Um, uh, yeah, very, very precious lady. <laughs> Is how long have you been in Albany now, Mashi? Well, you are you are so beautiful. Thank you for the introduction. <laughs> well, um, I, this is lovely. Thank you for the opportunity. And um, I like to say that the seed of pioneering was planted in my heart in sixties when uh, William Sears and Hand of the Cross, Mr. Furutan, they came to Iran and they encouraged everyone to get out of Iran and don't waste any time. So one of my conditions of marriage was, I'll marry someone who can travel with me <laughs> to pioneering places. <laughs> and that's what happened. So um, 70, no, 69, we married and 73, 
72, uh, we left Iran um, to, we went to Zambia, uh, to one of the African countries. And after, I don't talk about Zambia because it's too far away as well. <laughs> I like to talk about more closer to home. Um, in 85, um, March of 85, we came to, um, to Australia, to Perth. And I must say one of the first places we visited was Narogin. <laughs> and I remember that I wanted to come and see them pioneers because my heart was broken. We didn't want to leave pioneering posts and we were forced to leave Zambia. So, um, so that was the first uh, taste of Australian pioneer. Uh, and it was a, I remember it was one of the Baha'i holy days. And uh, it was so lovely to see Helen's children and Helen's family. And we had a devotional as well as a fireside talking about um, our trip in Africa and showed some slides and we were there for one night, I think. Then we went mm, to... I remember. Um, I think it was the the, um, uh, the martyrdom of the Barb. That was in July, wasn't it? In winter? I think it was in um, May. It was... Um, May. Oh, May, was it? Oh. Yeah, it was in school holiday. Oh, so oh, okay. that was when, I think it was... Um, um, Bob's declaration. Bob's declaration. That's I think right. it was yes. Bob's declaration. Was, I remember Ben actually saying that it feels like Christmas <laughs> 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 because they had family there. So it was a lovely, yeah. lovely memory of that. And then we went to Mount Barker to visit Phyllis and Murray uh, Coles. And we went, we spent one night with them. Um, and they invited one of their neighbors, so we showed them slides. And then we came to Albany, and we really fell in love with Albany. Our heart was in Albany before we got here, because in um, Zambia, um, my husband, Rui, he looked at the um, area of um, where Denmark is, and he said, you know, Denmark and this place are so close uh, in climate. So maybe we should go to Denmark and live there. And we ended up here in Albany. So um, we came, Ruth Bradley was here, their assembly wasn't formed then. And she really tried hard to help us finding a farm or a place of work. But we went back, we were very new in, in in Australia. So after a few months, my husband found a job. And after two and a half years, we came to live in Albany with work. And <clears throat> so that was really um, what we wanted to be. We didn't want to stay in big city. So we have three children by then. And uh, my oldest was doing year 11. And the second one was doing year nine and then our daughter was doing year two i think in second in primary school so then i don't know if you like to know who were here i have sort of tried to write their names one of the first persians that came here there were two young boys that came straight from iran and they didn't want to stay in city and they came down um Albany, and there were Farshad Javid, and he's in, I think, Melbourne community, Mel, Melville community in, in WA, and also um, Layeri, uh, Rahmat Layeri. So these two young boys with no language, they came, and I often think about how brave they were <laughs> and how um, wonderful they they were to just trust Baha'u'llah and come and live in a small town. And they found little jobs to do, a carpentry and piecework and this sort of thing. So Felora and Bob Edis were here, Felora Kashani and Bob Edis were here as well. So um, then they were, um, Bridget, she became Baha'i here. And um, Ruth Bradley, of course, was putting a lot of 
um, writings of the faith in the paper and constantly talking to people. So she was well known as a Baha'i in, in Albany when we came. And then we came, we started doing similar thing. I started going to TAFE mainly because I thought I need to extend the number of people I know. And that was a good place. So there I did some art, I did creative writing, I did secretarial, I did teacher assisting. So for years I was going to TAFE and that gave me the chance to actually meet so many people. So people here, they joke about it. The Baha'is, they say, oh, we talked to someone and they knew my sheet, of course. <laughs> 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 so somehow, somehow they knew me through, through the work I have done with them. And then, so we started radio program here. Uh, for years, we had a radio program every week on sun, Sundays and preparing all these programs were really hard. We were cut, cut and paste things and read them from, there was no, uh, skills for computer those days. We couldn't um, search for items. So we had to really do a lot of work that way. Then we started best classes here, Baha'i um, um, education, scripture education in schools. And that went for a long time until they closed that subject to schools, to primary schools. We had about 200 kids every year. And there are still some of them around. They see us, they give a big smile and say, I've been your student. <laughs> so it's lovely. We have done a lot of um, multicultural activities. I have been involved in um, migrant resource, uh, as a migrant resource worker, I have been involved with um, a lot of migrants coming in, in Harmony Days, in um, summer school here. Now they have, for years, I have done cooking, not Baha'i summer school, it's the Albany summer school. They've asked me to do cultural things, and there's always faith comes into it. So there's a huge um, amount of um, activity, like underlying activity with Baha'i activities is happening. Um, the Christmas pageant, for example, one of the times, few times in, a, in a many years, we took our um, Baha'i classes to Christmas pageant and walked with a big banner, um, Baha'is unite mankind. <laughs> so it's a big uh, picture in Albany. So we've done actually shows in town hall, uh, like Persian dancing event, Persian singing, mm -hmm. and um, cooking cultural food in schools and TAFE and secondary schools as well. I've just sort of dodged down. Ah, another thing is agricultural show. Agricultural show was a hit for a couple of years. So we took part in the activity and that resulted on a lot of people became aware of the Baha'is in, in town and information was given to them. Uh, fireside devotional meeting and um, series of activities. Now, one of them, which, which was very fruitful, and we see the result of it in town, is we had um, devotional gathering that we used Baha'i writing as well as as well as non-Baha'i writing. That was about um, years ago. I have to I have to find the detail of that one. Okay, that was. Um, I think 90, yeah, I have to see that. 91. Okay, about 2000, about 2000, we started making some um, devotionals and invited people and prepared food and sold the food. So the, all the money from that um, was gathered together and it was used for a peace pod that we installed in middle of town. Like this was really amazing because seven years of collecting money and encouraging people to come to these peace activities, we call them tranquility zone. 
and they loved it. We prepared it so beautiful with um, a lot of readings and music, background music, and we even had it in church halls. Mm. So um, as a result of these seven years, we gathered enough money and we put a peace pole with six sides and each side had written in different languages it had written may peace prevail on earth wow. and the languages that they used was aboriginal english chinese french japanese and italian and they are the representative i wish i could put this one on there uh. to to show that we had uh, the mayor of the town to come and open it for us and there was a man with a dove of peace that he released them it was so beautiful and this is actually a copy of the newspaper that it's part of our archive so i must mention name of one of our beautiful friend paul naderi or Pavis naderi who was behind this mm. peace pole as well and his memory is forever alive here. He passed away six years ago, just uh, after. Yeah, so this was, this was really a fantastic program. What I like to say is we need to be involved in so many activities. If we are not involved with the activities of town, they don't know you, they don't know us. And being a pioneer, it's fair enough to say that you go and uh, give all your services or you are a quiet person or you are an active person to talk about the faith that is important too but I think just being involved in the activity of town is very important I have one story to say and I've got so many things to tell you I've written them down but don't want to take everybody's time one story is story of um, John Rosman mm -hmm. John was an amazing lady. How we met her was a local assembly of Albany decided to send three um, delegates to uh, University of the Third Age because they asked for speakers. And so it was myself, Jim Bradley and Andrew Blake. The three of us went there. Each of us talked for was supposed to talk to for 10 minutes uh, about one thing. One was history, one was principle of the faith, one was um, administration of the faith. And this <laughs> 30 minutes became an hour because people started asking questions. But among all of the people there, one face stood out and that was Rose, and uh, that was Joan Rosman. And her lovely smile from the beginning till the end, I never forget. And when the talk was finished, she came to me and she said, I like to know more about Baha'i faith. How can I get more information? So I said, I gave her my address and my telephone number. And I said, Wednesdays we have firesides, so you come. And not remembering it, I went out on Wednesday afternoon <laughs> I came home about six o'clock and I see a car that I don't recognize outside the house and I came in immediately I remembered as soon as I entered the house I remembered oh my god this is the lady so she didn't get upset with me not being there but Ruhi was there so um, she kept on coming to our firesides and she read books and she studied and she was so eager. So John, after attending, if, uh, I think we went together, she became Baha'i after three, four months. And um, then we went to a, um, oh, then I think she went to a gathering that the auxiliary board member talking about pioneering and she got encouraged and she said, I want to move from Albany to Denmark, because Denmark doesn't have any Baha'is. So Denmark is about 50 kilometers from here. So, and with all of us saying, John, you're over 70 years old. 
you should stay here. You've got some health condition. No, 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 I have to go. So she left uh, Albany, but she went to a small caravan that was leaking and everything was so difficult. Denmark is very wet and cold and she was just bearing it. She was just um, trying hard to stay as a pioneer and she put uh, little writings of Baha'u'llah in the paper. She talked to people, she made flyers and gave it away. And so as a result of it, I think after some years back, some years later, um, few people became interested, but I think more pioneers came, like Massa Anderson and Gillian Malata. They came and there were few people from different places as well, and they formed their assembly for after that. So anyway, at the age of 80 something, um, with this health, you know, ill health that she had, she came back to, uh, Joan came back to um, Albany and she passed away in um, 2016. So her- Mashi, can yes. I interrupt for one minute? Sure. Because I've got her poem here. Would you like me to read it? Please, it is please. so beautiful. It's please. called My Silky Oak by Joan oh, Rosman. Yes. Can I read it? Please, yes. <laughs> Thank it's you. so funny. <laughs> Once oh. I had, oh, you'll cry, won't you? <laughs> uh, I am. I love this woman so much. I know. So I know. Um, once yeah. I had a silky oak whose leaves forever fell. Its spreading branches hid the sun. The gutter blocked as well. I asked Ruhi why it was my lemon would not grow. <laughs> he cast an eye around my yard. That silky oak must go. <laughs> Straight away he went off home and came back with his saw. He cut the branches one by one till Silky was no more. Yeah. Hugh then Hugh then with his trailer came or Hugh then with Hugh. his trailer came to cart the limbs away. The garden looked so happy to see the light of day. The lemon tree seemed greener, the flowers glowed so bright. The sun shone in the window pane and filled the room with light. Also, I have a silky oak that grows inside of me. Its spreading branches block the light and do not let me see. Pessimistic are its limbs, self-centered is its bark, and negative its foliage that keeps me in the dark. And Ruhi, I would be so pleased. <laughs> You're such a knowing bloke. If you could find a saw to fell my inner silky oak. That's <laughs> so beautiful. And that really describes Joan, doesn't it? It she? does it describe. We have, we are left. Okay. All right. So there we are. Everyone see all right? No. No? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Not very good at this. Okay. Is that okay, Graham? Yes. All right. Okay. All right, so I'll be very quick about this. Okay, these are all the places that we've lived in regional WA, from Laverton. Um, we went up to Derby. Uh, we went to Kununurra. And then from Kununurra, we went to Tom Price. We were there for 10 years, uh, had a local spiritual assembly in Tom Price. Um, and then we came down to Narragin. So, um, we were there for 19 years. So just do a very brief look at this. Um, these were like Mashid, we put on uh, a display at the agricultural show every year. This year, 1982, we arrived there. We were, um, okay, all right. Um, so uh, this, and, and at that particular year, we won the first prize for our um, best, show, best display in the show. <laughs> So we did this every year and a lot of Baha'is came down from Perth to help us. Um, and then on the uh, International Year of Peace, I think it was 1986, yeah, we converted our, our round globe into a, a year of peace display. So you can see it there and we had pony rides and my daughter had a horse, so we did pony rides and face painting and children's activities. Uh, quickly slide on. Uh, we had 35 Baha'is come down for a, a soccer 
um, a day uh, in Narragin. I told them that we we only had a very small soccer group in Narragin. So I said, oh, well, I'll ask the Baha'i Soccer Club if they can come down. And 35 mostly Iranian Baha'is came down in a big bus and uh, they had a wonderful day. It was a whole day of different scratch matches and, and everything. And a lot of them, were, uh, the, the people in the soccer club were Italians. So the Italians and the Persians got on extremely well. We had a, a very dynamic day. Um, we had Mrs. Mashirian visit us, which was very special. She stayed with us for a whole week. Um, and that's Ben, my son, and my daughter Ruth, who were with some flowers for Mrs. Mashirian. Um, we had the Baha'i Women's Conference held there uh, in um, oh, oh, another year. Um, sorry about that. I should have the year on there, but um, I haven't. <laughs> but uh, Mashid is there in the yeah. front. <laughs> you can see it. There's Mrs. Mashirian. There's Catherine Shawhead. Yeah. Um, there's Sylvia Chidlow, so there's there's quite a lot of uh, uh, Mrs. Majidi, and the, all these people gave little talks on different subjects at the um, at our conference. So it was a WA conference, so it was people. It was for everyone in Western Australia, but it was held in Narragin. Um, there were a lot of visits coming down, and this is one. And my daughter was always on her horse, so she was always taken in the photo with her riding her horse. <laughs> Um, there was Bob Edis and uh, Anayat, Jackie and Belinda. Here, I just had to put this in. This is Roger Ridley, who visited us many times. Despite his incredible handicap, he got around and he did just was a spiritual giant, that man. <laughs> Helen, can um, I mention this is in Albany, in one of yes, the it camps is, we at had, the summer and school. these are my hands. These are it my is, hands. It is. Working. That's right. It was in some, it, and I've only put it in there because it was a photo I had of him. That's yeah. beautiful. It is, yes. And uh, uh, Narragin and Albany combined together to do a lot of camps. Remember the camps, Mashid? Definitely. We had a lot of camps. Um, we had beautiful, remember the art camp we had? That's right. Circle yes, dancing, yes. and I taught a hand of calligraphy, and there was singing, and there was, oh, it was so beautiful. Was Bob Abraham for the coloring the drawing yes yes that's right yeah uh, it was just we, we did a lot of activities yes. together we used to um my husband used to have time down there relieving in albany uh relieving the welfare department down there and so we used to camp in a tent over the christmas holidays and just by the beach and so we would get involved in all these <laughs> various mm -hmm. activities with albany <laughs> um this was a really momentous gathering, this one here, the Sathi Sai meeting called, uh, had a meeting in the town hall called the Common Thread. And um, uh, it, it, um, they invited speakers. It was about the, the, talking about the unity of religion. And it was just incredible. They had all the symbols of the different religions. They asked me what I wanted for mine. And then at the back, you might see there's the unity candle here. Um, they had that burning the whole time about the unity of religion. Um, and it was called, it was talking about the common thread between all religions. Mm -hmm. They had 200 people came to it and they invited every religion in Narragin to give a speaker. And I, myself and the Catholic uh, church, the Catholic uh, priest were the only ones that accepted. Um, the others were all terrified of the Sarvabas. <laughs> they thought they were of the devil and <laughs> they had no, really were really worried about speaking at a, at a, a meeting like that. That's myself here. Um, but there were, um, yeah, there was just, it was a wonderful gathering. They, they put on a vegetarian meal for everyone at lunch. It was all free. And they had flowers everywhere, which they donated to the hospital at the end of the day. Honestly, if I could have organised a gathering like that and said it was Baha'i, I would have been so proud of it. <laughs> it was just so Baha'i-like. Um, and uh, I gave them some Baha'i books at the end for their library and they gratefully accepted them. So that was, that was a really lovely event. Um, we also, the Baha'is and the, the community of Melville, collectively put on the first spring festival in Narragin, which still happens. <laughs> every year they have a spring festival and we called it it's a rainbow world 
Oh, and yeah. we had the New Era Choir come down. We had Persian food stalls. We had, oh, it was just so many things happening. Um, and we ran a, an art competition throughout the schools and for adults where we had all these paintings. I've just put the bare minimum of stuff in here, but there, there were paintings came and uh, Drew Gates came down and, and he uh, judged the artwork and we had prizes for everyone. This is my daughter and my son. My daughter is painting Joe's face. <laughs> we had children's activities, so many, and this was the kids painting these boxes and putting them into a, uh, a castle sort of thing. Uh, just do this very brief. Uh, and then, um, then, Marshid again. <laughs> after, after oh, Nar I've just yes, said yes. a few brief things about Narogen, but then at the end of Narogen, all our children had left home and they were studying in Perth and we decided we were going to go pioneering again. So we went, we went to Blackstone, which was here. You can see the blue star. Um, it was right out about 2000 Ks east of Perth, a um, thousand Ks of gravel road <laughs> and um, the most amazing place, wasn't it Marsheed? Marsheed, this is Marsheed came out totally. and taught sewing there. Um, Very special. Very special. Yeah. Um, Me, I, we amazing. were there for three years. Um, my husband was the CEO of the community and I ran all the activities and did women stuff with the women and I think I we had a huge amount of creative activities going um I think I sold 600 paintings while I was out there just amazing prolific <laughs> yeah so um this was and that's my son both all my children came and worked out there at different times um this is Joe he was running the pool and doing all sorts of things everyone adored Joe <laughs> So beautiful. So in demand, I think it's because he fixed up their radios for them. <laughs> but uh, more than that, I think. Uh, and this is a bit more at Blackstone. Here they wove a, a giant basket, which was hung upside down in the World Expo at Germany. <laughs> it was wow. carted by truck and then boat all the way there. <laughs> yeah, these 17 women all worked on it. And they, look, that, that's them. And they... Um, they made this giant basket. <laughs> yeah, they were paid for it. Everyone got paid, so it was good. Um, this is my son worked out there, and that's him with Lynette, who was digging for honey ants. Yeah. These are some of the sports activities they had out there. There was the women had races with buckets on their head, buckets of water. <laughs> <laughs> um, eventually, my son Ben... Uh, went and worked he became the ceo of pada which was the probably the most remote indigenous community in western australia right uh, about 300 k's north of warburton ranges and this was him out there when we went out to visit him and we actually had a holiday celebration with the whole of the community out there with him it was just beautiful <laughs> he he loved being out there and and the people absolutely adored him <laughs> Um, he was only in his 20s when he did that. So, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, then uh, later on, we, we went up to, I just put these in because these are all Baha'i Indigenous women. Um, we, we later went to, um, uh, to Tom Price. Uh, it's all a bit of a over the place, but this is right up in Billa Luna and Mullen, and this is Patsy Mudgedell. She was the delegate to the, um, in 2000, I think it was 2002, was it? The uh, National One National Convention in Alice Springs. But Patsy was the delegate for the Kimberleys. Uh, that's her here. She was in Belgo when I caught up with her um, then. And Sue and Philip Ovar was on the National Spiritual Assembly. They lived at Billa Luna and I stayed with them for quite a period of time. And that was when uh, Philip was writing his book um, called uh, The Baha'i Faith, an Ab Australian Aboriginal Perspective. I can show it to you sometime. Can you see it there? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Ooh. But they, uh, they did a lot of paintings. This Patrick here, he did a lot of the paintings in it. And I happened to be there when he was editing the book. So I helped him go through it and get the, the writing and things correct. And, and this was um, 
his wife, um, uh, Rachel, and we set up a little sewing industry there for the people at Villa Luna, and she was in charge of that. This is uh, Rachel also and Sue. And this is Sue with all her children. She has six children. <laughs> Beautiful kids. Yeah. Um, they've now moved over Rockhampton Way, Queensland. So anyway, I just threw that in there. It's not quite in the right time zone, but um, this is the story I really want to tell. <laughs> so this is just that was just a bit of a preamble. Um, oh. Have I got have I got, I was going to start with this, and Graham said, no, no, you've got to say something about yourself. <laughs> so I've, I've done that in brief. Um, okay. So um, this is Ellie and Trevor McLean. Um, and I'm going to read this story to you because it's such a wonderful story. And to me, it is just reflects everything about pioneering that, uh, well, I, I had a, another story too, which I wanted to join in with this, but we'll see how we go. One evening in 1978, Ellie and Trevor heard a talk on pioneering with quotes from Shoghi Effendi in the home of Nola Hellman in South Perth. Relatively new believers, they decided right then they were going to pioneer and were so excited at the prospect, they and Nola started to dance in the middle of the floor. <laughs> they immediately applied to go to the Solomon Islands. However, after waiting for some time for their application to be approved, and hearing nothing, they were not sure what they should do. One evening, they went to a fireside at Gary Olson's place, where they were talking about the need for home front pioneers to Onslow. They thought, who would want to ever go there? A few weeks later at an RTC conference in Perth, that's the Regional Teaching Committee, Betty Fernandez was organizing a teaching trip to Onslow. And Ian Journey, you this still Ian? <laughs> offered the use of his old yellow bus, but they needed a driver. Members of that team were Billy Todd, Fahad Fosdar, Tita Farah, Jonathan Dean, Hamid Tahiri, and of course, Betty. None of whom could drive as they were either too young or not confident. After waiting all weekend to see if anyone else would offer and reaching the stage where everyone was saying their goodbyes, Ellie felt she would offer to drive the bus. And so the next week, they were off to Onslow, a small coastal town, 1,000 kilometres north of Perth. You can see it there. It's just up here. So they're going from Perth right up here. North of Carnarvon, it was gravel in those days. So on arrival, they set up... Um, oh, sorry, yeah. The trip was done in stages. Six hours to Geraldton, six hours to Carnarvon, then six hours to Onslow. They thought they were going to the end of the world. On arrival, they set up camp at the caravan park by the beach using tents and they had a, a dining, dining canopy. Every morning they were doing, every morning before doing anything, even before breakfast, Betty insisted they said the tablet of Ahmad nine times individually. Go and find your own rock, she said. And then after breakfast, Betty insisted we say the tablet of Ahmad around the table nine times again. It was this that enabled Ellie to memorize that prayer. And she is very grateful to Betty for that gift. After prayers and consultation, they went out and met people in the town and at Bindi Bindi village, meeting, talking and inviting them to attend the meetings, which were held in the Noella hall in the evenings. Many of the group were musicians, so singing, was uh, was very much a part of the program. There was a wonderful response from the indigenous and white people, especially the youth who responded to such a joyful, vibrant youth group. The evening meetings were full of gentle teaching, song and dance. It was a wonderfully successful trip and many of the indigenous friends they still know today declared at this time. On her return to Perth, Ali told Trevor they should consider moving to Onslow. Trevor's response was, I thought you'd say that, so I've been looking at four-wheel drives. <laughs> Not long after this, Ellie and Trevor, along with Ellen Major and Adrian Unger, travelled up to Onslow for a reconnaissance trip in a camper van with much the same program. And again, the response from the townspeople was remarkable. By this time, many people had declared and they needed deepening. 
Ellie and Trevor then met with the South Perth LSA and offered to pioneer to Onslow to bring a permanent Baha'i presence to the town. There were some believers, particularly from their own community, who thought they were not deepened enough themselves and shouldn't be doing this. However, they went ahead with the blessing of the South Perth LSA. Ian Journey donated an old wooden caravan and Nola a motor scooter and they filled the caravan with a bin of rice and fishing gear so they would feed themselves if they couldn't get work. They only had an old VW station wagon and not the four wheel drive they had hoped for, but were all set to take off when the motor in the car seized up. Another Baha'i, Wayne Lindsay, took the motor apart and completely rebuilt it so that they could get going. <laughs> the journey was not without its difficulties. Their car was really quite small to tow such a heavy caravan and at one point going down a hill it jackknifed out of control. They just called out the greatest name over and over again and it finally straightened up. They pulled over shaken but unhurt, their first miracle. <laughs> they lived in the caravan park in Onslow. The National Spiritual Assembly sponsored them with a small living allowance and they had their bags of rice and their fishing rods. Ellie was a hairdresser and made some money by cutting hair. And then later, after six weeks, Trevor got a job with the Shire for a short period. Later, he drove a taxi. With a few, within a few months, the local spiritual assembly of Onslow was formed, although Ellie was still too young to be on the assembly itself. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a thriving children's class. Members of that first assembly were Mavis Chubby, Treasurer, she's an Aboriginal lady. They're all Aboriginal except for Trevor. Jack Butler, Taji and Joe Limerick, Glad Gladys Dula, Joe and Joyce Inji, and Trevor. However, life in Onslow became difficult. People often couldn't pay the taxi fare and there were other issues that prompted them to move early in 1980 to Carnarvon, some 300 kilometers south of Onslow. They lived in Carnarvon for 20 years their children were born there. The LSA of Carnarvon was formed and the story continues in the next issue. <laughs> so here we are. Even though life for the Macleans had developed a more normal pattern, here's Carnarvon, it's south of Onslow, a little bit south here, uh, developed a more normal pattern and they had been blessed with the birth of their first child, Zarin, in 1981. Then Navav in 1983. They still kept in touch with the new Baha'is in Onslow, making regular trips north, mostly on weekends and holidays. When Ali went to hospital to give birth to Navab, two elderly Indigenous women, Nana Gumby, Gladys Dula, and Mavis Chubby, lived with them and cared for their two-year-old Zarin, <laughs> while Trevor worked at night at the bakery. Ali and Trevor were the only Baha'is in Carnarvon until 1984. Cliff and Cindy Stevens, American Baha'is who lived in the United States military base in Exmouth, were great friends during this two year period. One remarkable declaration during that time that Trevor will never forget was that of Robin Gibbs, who I think is in Albany, isn't he, Ashi? Yes, yes, he is. <laughs> he first met Robin in 1977 when he was working as a baker for tourist cakes in Perth. And Robin, with his head shaved, was a cleaner earning support money while he was studying at university. They would have, have a short discussion as Trevor knocked off work and Robin came in to clean up. In 1981, Trevor was on one of his teaching trips north and stopped at the Fortescue Roadhouse. He saw this heavily bearded fellow and thought he recognised him and he in turn recognised Trevor, but they couldn't work out where they'd known each other. A short after, they met in Carnarvon where Robin was working for the Carnarvon Research Station. They decided to meet for a meal together and then again at Trevor's house. It was here they suddenly traced with the help of photos their first meeting to the bakehouse in Vic Park. The mystery was solved. A discussion began about religion and soon they were deep into a conversation about the Baha'i faith, which went on all night. <laughs> this happened several times with Ali waking up in the morning to prepare breakfast for them. Finally, Trevor asked him if he would like a copy of the fire tablet. But as he only had a handwritten copy of it, Robin offered to type it out and return it. He bought the, brought the tablet back with a tape enclosed and then left for a trip. 
Trevor wondered what the tape was for. He played it and it was Robin talking that after reading the tablet, he had decided he wanted to become a Baha'i. Wow. Robin went on many teaching trips with Trevor and later pioneered to Alice Springs and Darwin with his wife, Sue, who also became a Baha'i. Then, of course, Peter and Marjorie Tidman moved to Carnarvon from, uh, from Caratha in early 1984. Peter was an optometrist and started a business, and for some time, Marjorie commuted to and from Perth to complete her degree in psychology. They were now a community and could give each other support. Firesides and musical evenings began spreading the story of the faith in Carnarvon. In 1985, with other pioneers arriving, the local spiritually of Carnarvon was born. Those on that first assembly were Peter and Marjorie Tidman, Yvonne Delby, Bob and Falora Edis, Gladys Dula, Ashok Chorhan, and Ellie and Trevor McLean. <laughs> wow. Oh my God. Um, I don't know, maybe I, there's so much to say. I, just, I was going to talk about was Edna, who at a, a very advanced age decided to pioneer to Bridgetown and is still there and uh, been there for 20 years. Um, and her story is equally as amazing. And we all from the Pilbara, like the Pilbara developed and Marjorie and Peter eventually moved to Tom Price. And then we went down, 10 of us from the Pilbara, we did all the, the Ruhi study books in the Pilbara with Edna on the phone. And, um, and then we went down and, and the 10 of us from the Pilbara painted uh, a mural on the wall in Bridgetown. Yes. So I have all the story of that, which I won't have time to read. Um, oh dear, dear, dear. Um, all right, I'll just finish with this. Okay. Um, this is from Catherine Shawhan, who's passed away. And she oh. said, my advice to others, especially the youth, is be active when you are young. Render service while you are studying. Study in a goal town or country where people Baha'is are needed. Go travel teaching in your holidays. Choose subjects to study that will be of service to others. When you're young, you are enthusiastic, optimistic and adaptable. You can sleep on the floor, try all sorts of food and adapt to different cultures. You are not limited by the many inhibitions of older people. So you happily go in and get things done. Mistakes are made, but you learn from them and the achievements usually outshine them. You have time to pray, to be guided by divine inspiration, to be unrestrained as the wind and closer to God. This is Catherine Shawhan. We pioneered to Sri Lanka for many years. And then, uh, as you saw, Ashok was on the first uh, assembly in Carnarvon and he went on a sailing boat across, to, <laughs> across the Pacific and ended up um, getting stranded in a storm on the on the shores of Sri Lanka and that's where he met Catherine and they married and came back to live in Bunbury. <laughs> so all this I've just abbreviated, abbreviated. So I'm and then uh, I wanted to tell this lovely story of Janiza Corte but I'm going to finish with this little poem by Amatul Baha Rehkanu, um, which Janiza when she traveled up to Derby um, uh, she really, uh, this was her, her um, inspiration, I suppose, this poem. Um, she went up there and worked there in 2009, but this was such a beautiful poem. To walk where there is no path, to breathe where there is no air, to see where there is no light, this is faith. To cry out in the silence, the silence of the night, and hearing no echo, believe, and believe again and again. This is faith. Sorry, I, I get cracked up with this one. <laughs> to hold pebbles and see jewels, to raise sticks and see forests, to smile with weeping eyes. This is faith. To say, God, I believe when others deny. I hear when there is no answer. I see though naught is seen. This is faith. And the fierce love in the heart, the savage love that cries, hidden, thou art yet here, there, yet thou art yet there. Veil thy face and mute thy tongue, yet I see and hear thee, love, beat me down to the bare earth, yet I rise and love thee, love, this is faith. <laughs> so, my dear Beautiful. friends, 
I'm sorry, I had so much to say. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> didn't balance my time very well. So my apologies to all those I have missed out on speaking to. <laughs> no, Helen, that was just, thank you. just a, a wonderful introduction to your own story, <laughs> that of so many pioneers in Western Australia. And we yeah. have more yeah. time. But yeah, I'm sorry for all those people. I had all your names written down and and I worked out there were so many Baha'is here in, in the southwest. Uh, I said in the um, in the south, in the 80s and 90s, there were Baha'is living in Albany, Bunbury, Harvey, Narragin, Collie, Katanning, Pinjarra, Mandra, Margaret River, Roland, Bridgetown, Donnybrook, Kalgoorlie, Esperance, Boulder, Coolgardie, Lake Grace, Denmark, Dardanup, Mandra, Hopetown and Wongan Hills. And in the north, in Onslow, Carnarvon, Geraldton, Tom Price, Laverton, Derby, Kununurra. And there were LSAs in, in, um, in where was it? Um, there was LSAs in the north, in Tom Price, in Geraldton, in Carnarvon, and in the south, in um, Collie, in Bunbury, in Albany, in Kalgoorlie. <laughs> No, honestly, I just, it's just astounding. And, mm. and uh, I remember the Baha'is, there were so, only three assemblies in Perth and they're all saying that the, their talk was about Shoghi Effendi saying, you've got to get out of the city. Everyone was talking about it for their own sakes as well as for uh, the teaching of the faith. So sorry, everyone. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Yes. Thank you. Go. Um, <laughs> Um, perhaps if, if everybody could just for a moment put their uh, cameras on so they can at least wave to Helen and, and sorry the, sorry everyone I'm uh, sorry uh, if I left you out <laughs> express our thanks that so many people have been watching and listening to your story and we hope okay you, take care everybody thank you, so thank you for listening thank you. <laughs> okay so thank you so we're going to move on now to the second part of our story today and uh, it's being introduced by Stephen Mossy Johns now Stephen Mossy had been married since 1980 and Steve had been pioneering for many years before that in parts of Australia. But now with Mozzie at his side, they continued their, their journeys ever since really. The decades since 1980, they've traveled uh, to, um, since the marriage, they've, they've pioneered in Mariba and Croydon and Alice Springs and Nullaby and Santa Teresa, places I've never heard of uh, in the North. And uh, they currently live in Palmerston, community of Darwin, uh, Steve is uh, semi-retired, but uh, still doing his, his painting, and he's a counsellor. Moziana's uh, a case manager with housing in uh, Mission Australia, and she's finishing a community development degree. There's much more to say about them as in themselves, but they have their story to tell with the, the community around them, and they've also got some guests online. So I'm going to hand over now to Stephen Mossy. Welcome to the city. It's over to you. I've got to, yeah, thank you very much, Graham. Yeah. Um, I, I will um, just talk about where, since I've been a Baha'i, I've been pioneering. I, and that was caused through the hand of the cause and Florence Spitzner, actually. Um, they kept on telling me, telling me that, um, um, that you've got to do it now. Otherwise, the time will come when you cannot do it. You cannot do it. And there are many things that we can do now. Don't worry about it. There are many things we can do now that we, that, um, and, and uh, there are things like pioneering overseas and all that were, that were really urgent, okay, in those days. Now they're not so important. But we had the opportunity back in those 80s and earlier to do those things which couldn't, cannot be done now. And that's why they emphasise the importance of getting out and doing it now. And, and like doing the Ruhi Institute, getting the children's classes going, getting all those um, junior youth programs going. In another 20 years, they'll be fighting who's going to do it because there'll be so many people to do it. You know? And that's the point that Hand of the Cause and Florence Fitzner pointed out. But anyway, it was because of um, Hand of the Cause I... I finished up in Mount Tom Price. I, I was the first behind Mount Tom Price and uh, was only there for six months raising money to go on pilgrimage. And um, while I was in Mount Tom Price, I, I had many firesides, but one, only one person became a Baha'i and, and that's uh, Graham Eldridge. He lives in Warwick now in, um, in, in 
Queensland. And then I went from there, I was met these Christmas Islanders and they invited me to go to Christmas Island. So I went to Christmas Island and um, the National Assembly of Australia was so happy I was going because they had no idea how many Baha'is were on Christmas Island and how many, what sex they were or anything, how old. So I, I went out to Christmas Island and we elected the first local spiritual assembly there and and i stayed there for a month but when I, then i went on pilgrimage from christmas island to go i went to um uh well i went to thailand and i was supposed to pioneer in thailand and I, when i went on pilgrimage to the national spirit they sorry the uh, international teaching center asked me to go back to christmas island so i eventually went got back to christmas island that's a big another story in itself um, but eventually got back to Christmas Island and I was able to stay for, for three months and then I had to leave, but my visa expired. And I came back to Perth and I stayed with Trevor and Ellie in, in Perth, um, in South, South, uh, and what happened was I eventually wrote to the Universe House of Justice and asked them if I could pioneer somewhere else instead of going to Christmas Island because it was just too difficult to get there. And I suggested, could I go to Tonga? So I left, actually I was living with Trevor uh, and, and I left Perth and went finish up by going to Tonga and, and pioneering there where I met my wife. And two years later, after arriving, we, we, came to come, we came back to Australia. And from there, we were just pioneering and pioneering and pioneering, going from different places to different places. But finally, we finished up in, in um, Croydon, up in the, in the Gulf of Carpentaria, which was an outstanding place for us. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and put this slideshow on. Uh, yeah, thank you. There we are, but it's not starting in the right place. So have to... Okay. So um, what happened in, in, in 19... 80, uh, well, in 83, we were living in Mariba. Moshe and I were living in Mariba. And the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is in Australia asked us if we would go to Mornington Island to elect the local spiritual assembly. Because in, 19, in the 1970s, Marvash Masters with a team of youth went to Mornington Island and enrolled about 80 local Aboriginal Baha'is there. This is the map of, of uh, where it is. This is where we were living in Mariba, and we had to go to um, Mornington Island. Now, the National Spiritual Assembly wanted us to fly to Mornington Island. Well, they did. They, they said they'd fly us. So, but we, we thought, well, we'll save money and we'll drive to Normanton instead of, we'll catch the bus, actually. We'll catch the bus to Normanton and then charter a flight from there to Mornington Island. Well, we, um, we set off on our journey and we got to, we got to Croydon and there's just a picture of Marvin and Joy Stevenson. But we got to, um, we got to Normanton, uh, to Croydon, sorry. No, to, and we, we said, who would live in a place like this? What a dump. Okay, and then we, the bus proceeded on to Normanton. And we camped in a, in a caravan park opposite the Purple Pub, I remember. And um, all night, the purple, while the Purple Pub was operating there, all these yelling, you in the tent, come and join us in the pub, come and... They were all trying to invite us to come over to the pub, but we restrained, we, we, we didn't go. Anyway, in the morning, we went, we went to, um, over the road to um, buy breakfast. And it, we um, went and sat out on a bench outside the shop. And there was a young girl there with a photo album sitting right next to me. And she opened the photo album and there was a picture of an Aboriginal man standing in front of the shrine of the bar. And I said, who's that? To her, oh, that's my father. Oh, I'd like to meet him. And she said, I'm sure he'd like to meet you. And then the bus came and she left. So. What happened then was uh, we went out to Mornington Island, which is another story in itself. We went out to Mornington Island, came back, and we went back to Mariba. And about three weeks, three days later, 
three, no, three weeks later, we got a, a phone call from Marvesh Masters asking if we'd go out to uh, Mornington Island with her. So we said yes, and we headed, we headed out, we, she arrived and we headed out to Mornington Island. Now I'll let Mossy tell the rest, tell the next part. So, um, if I go on quickly to that, I want to, to say that in 1982, we, we were caretaking the temple while the, the, the caretakers went on holidays. And so we thought, you know, we're gonna apply for the, for the job because it was, it was available. And um, Langshaws, that's the caretaker. Anyway, we applied for the job and um, that the National Assembly was meeting in that weekend. And um, Paul Stafford came to us and said that uh, the National Assembly wanted to know uh, what we will do if we don't get the job. And we said, oh, I think we will move north of the tropics of Capricorn. But prior to that, there was a big message for Universal House of Justice that people start to move north of the Tropic of Capricorn. So what happened, and then he came back and said, the National Assembly said that you didn't um, get the job. So we hop in our compi van and headed up to Mackay. And um, there arrived Ian Journey, to be his the hero of hero, arrived and he said to us, he was selling mangoes and he said to us, why don't you come to Mariba? And a little short time later, we went to Mariba, but we told my brother Fineva and Dolores Tafalele to um, stay back until we can find a house. But anyway, they came back two weeks later. So we are all living in Ian Chandy's house. Thank you, Mel and Ian. So this trip here, for the people who know Marvish, late Marvish Masters, this is a very proper lady. So, um, so we went on the trip and we arrived in Croydon and decided to camp on the side of the, uh, of, beside this pond and, uh, oh, the, um, the, creek. the creek. And anyway, we set up two tents, one for, for Marvish and one for Steve and no, I. I was gonna sleep in the car. Anyway, Marvish ended up saying, don't worry, we all sleep in the same tent because this is right in the bush. So she was terrified. So in a way, um, she wanted to have a bath and um, and we went to the creek and I saw the color of the, of the water and so I said to her, well stay here and I'm going to get you some water and you can have a bath. So in the next morning <laughs> she was like, what? What did I bath? What did I bath in that muddy water? Anyway, oh, so that part of there and we told her the story of what we saw, the the, of the photograph, what the young girl so she said, okay, let's say some prayers to find this man. And the people who know my Vesh Master, that will be what she does. So I'll hand it back to Steve. We, we headed off, it's about two and a half, um, two and a half hours, all dirt road, very rough old dirt road. And all we had was an old Holden Kingswood. Anyway, we got into town and we went to the cafe to have some breakfast. And we walked into the cafe and there's this Aboriginal man in the cafe saying, Marbash attacks him. And I, and I heard her talking about the faith and, and I heard him say, oh, I've been to Israel. So I went in and said, have you got a daughter? And she showed me a photo of you. And he said, yes, she told me about you. And then from that moment on, he kept on following us around and making sure that we, uh, that we were going to come back to see him when we came back from uh, Mornington Island. This photo ha here is Mossy sitting on Mornington Island. And this is, um, these were Baha'is, um, this was Edna Adams, I think. Yes. She came down to the conference in Surface Paradise with us. And Lindsay Ruffsey, he was the, a very famous Aboriginal who, his, his face is on the first five cent piece that came out. And that's one of the other Baha'is. I can't remember his name, but that was just on Mornington Island. And that was Marvesh on Mornington Island with one of the Baha'is there. Then we came back. This is the man. This man here is the man who followed us around, wanting us to come round to, to his house to tell, tell him about the faith. And that's Ian Cherney. Do you know Ian Cherney? He's, he, anyway. And when we came back, 
we followed him to his house and we sat there for four or five hours talking about the faith with his wife, him, and, um, and his father, and, and his, no, his father, and, he, um, and his daughter. And Marvesh said, do you want to become Baha'is? And they said, um, uh, oh, can we talk about it? And can you, can you come back in the morning? So we came back in the morning and they all wanted to become Baha'i, including the 12 year old girl, Tracy. Just in the sideline, she rang me up the other day saying she's doing book one um, in, in Mount Isa. Anyway, so Lance became the first Baha'i in the Gulf of Carpentaria. But the strange thing was that Mossy said to him, do you know anyone in Croydon who would want to hear this message? And um, Lance said, oh, yeah, my, my, my um, brother, my cousin brother, he would love to hear this message. So he arranged to meet him there at 6.30 the, the following weekend. Now, this, uh, the journey out to, from Mariba to Croydon is 1,100 kilometers return. So we drove out there again on the Friday and met him at six o'clock and he introduced us to George and, and they became Baha'is that night too after talking to them, him and his wife and Ethel and, and his, his wife's, um, the, Ethel's sister from Mornington Island became Baha'i at that night. So we went back to the LSA of Mariba and said to the LSA, we should make Croydon our goal. And the LSA said, where is Croydon? So we had to explain where it was, but the LSA accepted Croydon as, their, as the goal. And for the, next, for the next three years, Mossy and I kept on going backwards and forwards there at least once a month, sometimes once every two weeks, we would go out to Croydon and, and meet and, and, and um, um, meet the whole community, basically. And then, but on, that, on those times, we had very interesting, exciting events happen. But one of them was we were, we borrowed my um, brother-in-law, Feeney, van, and we camped in a little place on driving out there. We camped in the place in, in a place called um, 40 Mile Scrub. And this is a really strange place. It's in the middle of the desert and it's rainforest. And when we camped, we camped there and um, we used up a lot of water having cups of tea and everything. And in the morning we, we got up and um, headed off. And we got about 20 kilometers, and which is about another, it's another 80 kilometers on the Mount Surprise, the next town. And we got about 20 kilometers and the fan belt broke. And I remember a story that Raheer Khanum told us that when she was um, in Africa, her and Vila were traveling along in their Land Rover and they broke an axle. And, and she got out of the car and held up her arms and said, surely there's a mechanic up here that can fix this. And five minutes later, a mechanic arrived in the same vehicle and he had a spare axle and he fixed Rahir Khanum's car. So I remembered that and um, I got out the van and said, surely there's a mechanic up here that can fix this. And then we got into the, into the van and we sat there and said the Tablet of Ahmed. And while we were saying the Tablet of Ahmed, a car stopped behind us. And we got out the car and I, he said, oh, can you, I helped you. And I said, oh, we've broken a fan belt and we've got no water. And he said, oh, that's okay. So he took me to the back of his car and he's a fan belt salesman. And he, he comes once a month to sell fan belts out in the Gulf. He put the fan belt on for us and gave us water and, and we didn't have any money. So he said, oh, it's okay. Pay at the next store when you get there. They'll, they'll take the money. So we drove on and paid for, the, paid for the fan belt and continued on to Croydon. And, and so it was on and on. All these three years of trips had all of these different stories. I could go on and on with them. But in 1988, we decided to move to Croydon. And I, I, just before I say that now, it was like every time we traveled out to Croydon, 
we arrived sometimes at 10 o'clock at night, George and Ethel would be waking up for us. We didn't tell them we were coming. We had no internet or anything in those days. We didn't tell them where we were coming, but when we got there, every time they were waking up for us with a meal, they knew we were coming. Anyway, um, we, in 1988, we moved out there. Well, first of all, Feeney, Mossy's brother and his wife, Dolores, they moved out there. Um, Lance had asked them, Feeney was a farmer, and Lance asked them to come to Normanton and, and they had an old Chinese farm, which is about 40 kilometers out of, uh, out of Normanton. Um, and he wanted, he wanted Feeney to try and get the farm up and running again. Well, we went out there. After about six weeks, we went out there. And Feeney took his three kids out there. We went out there and, and, and we were shocked. Feeney, they had this big lake there. That that's where they were bathing in this big lake. All the kids and everything were bathing in the big lake. They had snakes everywhere. And, and we said, we're taking the kids. We, we took the kids back to Mariba and then Feeney followed us. He didn't know what to do. He wanted to please Bahala so bad that he was putting up with all of this stuff just so he could please Bahala. And we had to advise him that he was gonna kill everyone before he did please Bahala. But anyway, eventually he moved back to Croydon and got a job in the council and we moved a month later. About that time, I was earning quite a bit of money selling paintings at the Marie, at the Karanda markets. And, and all the Baha'is were saying, you can't go. What are you, how are you going to earn a living out there? How are you going to earn the money? Anyway, we said, oh, we're going to go anywhere. We need to go. We got out there. And we were staying in a, in, in a caravan in the back of the post office next to the police station. And the police came out. They came and said, has any of you people Steve Johns? And I said, that's me. And they said, can you ring this number? And I was really worried. What have I done? What have I done? So I rang up this number. And it was in, in 1988, they had the World Expo in, in Brisbane. And they were, I rang up and they said, we're, we want, you've been chosen out of, um, for, uh, out of six artists to be one of the six artists to represent Queensland in the Expo 88. Can you send us 400 paintings? I said, I haven't got 400 paintings, but I can send them, you know, a, a few every week. And they said, that'll be fine. So that provided us with the income for, for, for our uh, Croydon adventure. Oh, okay. So, so, so a couple of weeks later, we, we had friends there um, who owned a house. It was an old house. And um, it was really, it was 112 years old, actually, but that house became a very important place. Um, what happened was they wanted a caravan. We had a caravan, so we swapped the house basically for a caravan. And the government gave us $7,500 first home, homeowners and the house cost 15000 So we bought the house. Now, we went on to have so many firesides and, 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 um, and the firesides and, and the feasts and everything all in this house. And it got to the point where everyone in the town would turn up at the feast. We, we had at least a hundred people sometime at the feast. And we eventually got enough Baha'is to form the local spiritual assembly. And, 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 and Mossy and I were the only non-Aboriginal Baha'is on the local spiritual assembly. And these two here, Titch and Ella, they, which is Alloween, our daughter, as grandparents, they became such eager teachers. They traveled to um, Kawanyama. They traveled everywhere teaching the faith. Um, one time they wanted to go out to Kawanyama and we had no petrol for them. And um, there was the, the, the time of the uh, Rodeo. It was a Croydon Rodeo. And I walk, they had a ball, you know, like every, every Renee, they had a ball. And I walked through the door and I won the door prize. And we were worried about where we we're going to get the money for this fuel. 
and the door prize was a 44 gallon drum of fuel. <laughs> um, so they headed off. I also won the next prize, which was the raffle, and it was 12 cartons of beer and a bottle of whiskey. And I, I made it known that I was going to take this whiskey and pour it on the dead tree, which was the memorial. <laughs> And they, they, when they delivered it to us, they only delivered cartons of soft drink. <laughs> Paintings that I was doing, and, but they, they were on marble. I, I haven't got any photographs of them. Uh, but, sorry? When we bought the house, this is what the house looked like, actually. <laughs> it, was, it was an old, uh, really timber home. And we actually turned the house eventually into an art gallery. And we had so much business and that kept us going. Yeah, the income of that kept us going. Yeah. Okay. So I just want to say uh, a, a, another thing that, that what really keep us as pioneers going is the visit, um, the visit from the Baha'is that come through and especially Ian Jenny coming with his veggie truck. We look forward every to week. seeing every week to see him and he bring, because you do, even though the two of you, you felt like isolated. And the other thing was the National Assembly of Australia, the secretary was David Podgers. So I just want to say hello to him. He used to send us like um, every once a month, there'll be a letter from the National Assembly saying, um, we're thinking of you, we are praying for you at the house of worship. Uh, we pray that you succeed what you're doing. And you know, whenever we got that letter, uh, unknown to David Podger at the time, we stop everything and say, let's go and earn this. Okay, what can we do to earn this, um, the, the fuel? You know, because we see there's a fuel from the National Assembly, how important it was that, they, that those letters arrive to pioneers who feel they are away in a far away. One, one of the, the greatest gifts that we had in Croydon is Ellie there, Ellie Siberia, are you there? The other, the other people that were, were so important for this area is Nettie and Tony and, and Bristow Stag and they're in, they're in Normanton still now but they're gonna, when I get to a certain point they're gonna take over and start talking about Normanton, okay? And the the most important thing that we found when we formed this local church assembly and we had the, um, we had the um, uh, LSA running, that they wanted the fund. Their, their most important thing that they wanted was the Baha'i Fund. And they got all the children to collect change and everything to put money in the Baha'i Fund until eventually we got enough money to buy machinery for them to... Um, to start making artifacts and everything to sell it for tourists and everything. Um, the other, the, then the next most important thing that happened in Croydon was that's Ellie there. <laughs> Ellie Sabiri now. She was Ellie Metallaby then, and that's Hand of the Cause there. But the next one was the Hand of the Cause Feathers and the Magic attend our winter school. I um, had guests from various parts of the country come to our winter school. This is Hand of the Cause and, and Sahi Zarekshan playing, uh, I can't remember now. Anyway, that, that, that was at the summer school. Um, and there's Madge was there. We had quite a few Baha'is. This is the collection of some of the Baha'is. This is um, uh, Tessie Owen. She was the, the other, Lance Owen. She was one of the, the first Baha'is in Normanton. And, and uh, of course, that's Ruthia. Uh, and, and Ethel, now, Ethel has moved to Mornington Island. And Ethel is a very famous artist now in Mornington Island. And we rang her, we spoke to her about two years ago, and she still said she's a Baha'i. The other person that we got, um, who was a very special person, that's Mr. Featherston addressing everyone. He stayed for a week with us. In in um, in Croydon, in our fallen down old house, which had no no ceilings in, in in most of the rooms. At one time, we were sitting around the table, and our, my niece was there, and she turned around and said, "When's this hand of the cause 
started, when's he coming? And he put his arm around her and said, that's me, darling. <laughs> and and um, then he, we asked him questions and I'll never forget it. He was talking about when he became, when he was appointed the hand of the cause and he told the story of, of the, how, he, when he was appointed the hand of the cause and tears were rolling down his face. And it was a very emotional moment for all of us. So uh, during, this time, um, during this time as well, we had a number of uh, tribal teachers come through and we had um, Sato and Ira Williams and, we, and come in this group from Toowoomba and also Fari Walker. That is the one that we remember. So they came to Croydon and they did all the travel uh, teaching, teaching and everything in the town hall. Then a lot of people become Baha'i. So 25% of the population were Baha'is and they were Aboriginal except for Stephen, myself and my brother Fine and Delroy Stafalele. So I remember this time here, we were waiting for the people to come in the hand of the course was only the kids coming to the, to the, to the winter school. And we were started crying, we were sobbing because the, the adults didn't come. And the hand of the course um, sitting next between us, <laughs> put his, his hands on arm, arms, both of us, and said, remember the tears of pioneers. You know, so um, those, those things, those things that happen, um, is said pioneers to us are really strange people they they um they got these things about not relying on anybody but god and um and that uh, nothing is impossible and everything that they want to achieve and achieve and and the national spirit assembly or the universal how they write to them it gives them the feel to be able to do this so you don't um they don't um really decide what to do you know what is good for them it's just what is god want us to do so maybe Ian want to see it. There's just one one thing that I, I want to talk about. This is just other pictures of the meeting. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is some of the friends that used to come and visit us. But I want to talk about, um, and that's not, Fiona Scott, it was then. What's her name now? I can, what's his name? Uh, uh, NSA. NSA. I mean, she was a bit younger then. Mysterian. Fiona Mysterian, but it was Scott then. Anyway, and it's still Scott. And Dr. that's Halloween's mum there. Dr. Scott. Dr. Yeah. Scott, still Scott. Okay, yeah. And um, and that's. I want to talk about Uncle George when he passed away. This was this was really significant. Uh, we used to go away every every Christmas um, to sell paintings. We used to go down south to make money. To, and, and, and we, many a trips, we, we had a bus and we used to take the bus and we used to take kids and, and everything down in the bus and everything. But we were always broke just before we were about to go. And Uncle George had just retired and he just got his superannuation, which was only about 60,000. And, and he came up, was hanging around the yard on the day before we left, just hanging around, wouldn't leave us alone. And eventually he gave me an envelope and in that envelope, was a thousand dollars cash and a thousand dollar money order. And I said, what's this for? And he said, this is to help you out. You've been helping us out all the time. I want to pay you back. So it, reluctantly, we took the money because we didn't want to disappoint him. So we went down south and we were in Kempsey and we got a phone call from, from, um, from, from the national office saying that Uncle George had passed away and they would, were holding the funeral until we got there. So we had to travel from Kempsey to Cairns and then from Cairns back out to Mariba, uh, back out to Croydon. And they were, weren't gonna have the funeral until we got there. And guess what, how much it cost us? It cost us $2,000, the money he gave us to attend his funeral. And we got there and all the churches were there, all come to bury him. And, and his wife, Ethel was saying, I, I remember I arrived and she's telling this Catholic priest, he is not a Catholic, he's a Baha'i. He's gonna have a Baha'i funeral. I remember him and the, the priest was saying, he can't do that, you can't do that. And she said, yes, I can. And she was really arguing with the, all the priests. 
and anyway, we had the funeral. Ian Journey, which was there, and we, we went to the gravesite, and Ian said the long funeral prayer. And it was about 140. I mean, it was so hot. And it, the sky was as blue as anything. And suddenly, when Ian started that prayer, a cloud came over. And, and everyone was shocked that the cloud came over the sun. And suddenly, it started raining. And everyone was just blown away by, by this. In the middle of nowhere, this, this rain started happening. And then we, we went back to the wake. And Ian supplied all the, uh, all the watermelon. Anyway, it was everything for the wake from his fruit truck. And then um, the priest came up to me because in, in the hall before I, I told the people that we're not, we're sad for ourselves. We're not sad for George because George will be extremely happy. And this priest came up to me and said, how dare you say that George went to heaven? You have no right to say that. And I said, George didn't want to go to heaven. He just wanted to please God. <laughs> and the, um, everybody was listening. And they're all going, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's um okay. Okay, now I'm gonna hand it over to Tony and Nettie to talk about Normanton. Okay, you there, Tony? Yes, thank you, Steve. Can you hear us? Please? Okay. I hope I've got the slides. Just tell me when to change the slides. There's only a few of them. That's okay. That's the bus. It's interesting how we tied into the first story too, because uh, uh, Nola was the one that inspired us to take that bus that you're showing to the uh, Peace Expo in '86. She inspired oh, us to, flag. to pioneer from um, Perth, and actually we sent one of the first four-wheel drives up to Carnarvon. But anyway, it's funny how we tied into everything. But we came over in '86, and Ian picked us up. Ian Journey picked us up, and, and we drove this uh, fruit truck out to Croydon. And that's how, of course, we met everybody out there as well. So yeah, that's that's where that bus came into it. It, it, took, it took, took us up to or back up to North Queensland. That one, we drove it across Australia with one planet, one people, please down the side. Yeah. So yeah, Steve, we, what, what else you got there, mate? Uh, Rowley and and, and um, Michael Cockatoo. So Granddad Rowley was uh, um, one of those very spiritual people. He was a, a man that wanted to do elder of the tribe up here that wanted to do all the things for his people. He, he was Doreen Cockatoo's, uh, Doreen Cockatoo's uh, John. uncle, great yeah. uncle. Yeah, and that's Johnny Cockatoo, isn't it? Yeah, Robert Cockatoo, yeah. Michael, Michael, Michael Cockatoo, sorry. Michael, yeah. yeah, Michael. Yeah, that's his nephew. So, so Granddad Rolly Gilbert, we became good friends with him and he attended, he came a Baha'i and he attended Baha'i, but he was a man of every church, so he said, I only believe in one God. And so he went to every church. Um, and he passed away once again early in 90. We only up here a couple, about a year, two years before he passed away. And we, had a, we also had a, the family agreed that the Baha'is would um, have a funeral as well as the church, because the church wanted to hold the funeral. But they said the Baha'is could be involved. Stephen Mossy came up um, also for this funeral. And it was going to be held at the church. Um, and we were going to have say something in the church, but the pastor there also didn't want us to have anything to do with it. So we graciously withdrew and said, we'll just do something out of the, because he's going to be um, buried at More More Pastoral Co, which is a cattle cup, uh, cattle, cattle company yeah. that he wanted to get for his people, which he managed to do. And so they took, they had the funeral at the hall, uh, at the church, and then we moved out to the, all drove out to this cattle station, which is 100 kilometres away, uh, to do his burial. And when we got out there, the priest had already flown there, and he told the people there that he also didn't want the Baha'is to be involved in any, any of the funeral there, who he, or he would leave. So once again, the family were a bit agitated, so we withdrew again and said to the family that we'll have the Baha'i pair after he leaves. So they had the Christian burial out there, then, then the the, the pastor flew away and then we actually went over to the gravesite and read, read the long um, burial prayer with everybody in place, everybody attended. So it was a really special moment there as well. So that's that one, Steve, yeah. Rolly, very, very, he gave our son a, a tribal name. So this is Ian, Ian did this trip here. So Ian's probably better to discuss that one. Sydney. <laughs> yeah. 
So we've got uh, a lot of people in there. Our son Bradley sitting there in front of the fellow with the white shirt is Sydney Lane. He's still just down the road from us. His wife Marilyn was in an earlier picture. They both became Baha'is, but the church opposition, um, they withdrew after a bit of church, church op opposition. Mm. That's, that's never. never. <coughs> so Ian knows more about this trip here because he's the one that took them out. This is out to Delta Station. He took a camping trip out there. Mm. You remember, Ian? Yeah, I, I can't forget. Um, <laughs> You're getting older, you know. One of the big, one of the big things which helped with the teaching is we take a whole group of people with us, and they made friends, and everybody enjoyed mixing with each other, and it had such a powerful effect. The mixing of all the coloured people and the whites and everything like that. But one um, day while we were there, Rolly was quite a character. And um, he, I remember Michael, you see Michael above him, he said that Rolly had selective hearing. He'd only hear what he wanted to hear and then he'd comment, but otherwise he'd keep quiet. So he was quite a funny bloke. But while we were there one night, he came and he spoke to me and we sort of knew each other reasonably well. And he said, you know, Ian, it would be really good if you could help um, feed, help feed the um, children in Normanton because the parents drink so much, they don't feed the children well and we should try to do something, you know. Yeah. And I was really touched by his foresight and his um, love for the people. And, at that situation, I was not sort of able to do much, but we talked about it a bit. And he also was responsible for establishing, helping to establish the first indigenous cattle station in, in that area. So he was a very um, outstanding person in that region. So these are some of uh, the stories. and. There was another person there who was, um, I'd just like to mention, was Daisy Burnett. Oh, and mm, out in these areas, I don't know, you don't know about, in, she came from Old Marpoon. In, in 1963, the government and the church burnt down Old Marpoon. And all the old Marpoonies were scattered around the whole of North Queensland and other areas. John and very hard. And um, Daisy Burnett <coughs> went to Normanton. And later on in her life, she became a Baha'i. And um, these people really are spiritual giants. They're so humble. Um, you cannot yep. imagine the suffering that they've gone through and yet they're so content. Anyway, we arranged finally for a trip. This was about 30 years later for her to come on a teaching trip to Old Marpoon. And yeah, yeah so yeah. she went all the way to Old Marpoon and she cast her line in there and she caught a big fish when she got there. So <laughs> it was such a homecoming from her because she'd been forced out and she came back. But she was such a beautiful Baha'i and all the Baha'is were really so um, endearing and so amazing what they'd gone through. And just the other day I was at a fireside in um, in Cairns at Mona's place. Yeah. And Mona's done such a wonderful job. Mm. And at that fireside, three people turned up. It was uh, a lovely lady called Myrtle from Pompera mm. and Michael Cockatoo and Myrtle's uh, daughter. And Michael himself has gone through so much in his life and he's still such a steadfast Baha'i and his parents, John and Doreen, really um, enabled us to go travel teaching to all 
the indigenous areas in North Queensland. He went to Pompera, uh, not Pompera, to Aracoon, to Pompera, to Doomagy, to um, Old Marpoon, and they did the teaching and we followed. And they, and they were, they enabled they us. They were our educators. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, and in a sense, what Mike, what um, Steve was saying, they are our educators in that. Um, that's the beauty of the Baha'i faith is mixing amongst people of different cultures, and you learn so much from the different cultures. It just um, opens your eyes, and we can see that the indigenous people will have a big role to play in the future. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. I've spoken too much. Thank you. I just want to um, say something um, that I want to show some. I, I want to uh, come back. And if you can see us, Halloween is a product of, of Croydon. Um, she was the um, she was the reason we left because the police rang up one day and said, get Halloween out of town. They're coming to get her. This was right in the beginning of the stolen generation thing. And, and they were coming to get her. And then the matron rang up and said, um, they're coming to get her, get her out of town. So we actually threw everything we could in the station wagon, the tiny little station wagon. We had the dog, the bird, Halloween, and us two, and whatever we could fit in, and left everything. We lost our house, our caravan, everything. Um, and went down to Mergen to, to live. But she is the fruit and she is a very active behind now, so. Oh, wow. Yeah, so um, <laughs> I'm running children's classes and JY. And I'm doing book sticks at the moment with mum and dad and my husband. Christopher. And two beautiful grandchildren. And two weddings, yeah. Yeah. So, so she's one of the products of yeah. um of Croydon. And our other daughter, who who is now she lives in Abu Dhabi. She's from Croydon too. Mm -hmm. She lives in Abu Dhabi and she has got three three degrees in MBA. And she is a, a, a head of a department with Etihad Airlines in Abu Dhabi from, from a young girl in Croydon. Yeah. This is Ellie. Can I just, can I just, um, I've just joined. Yes, Ellie. Oh, I got the time wrong, so I just joined. I thought we did. <laughs> can I just say something about Carmen? She contacted, yep. Go for she, it. She contacted me. A little while ago, a couple about my, a year ago, and I did my youth year of service up with up there with um, Steve and Mossy, and honestly, it was the year that made me who I am today. It was the year that made me grow into um, and find the faith for myself, even though I was born into a Baha'i family. And I would really encourage anybody who can to pioneer and anybody who has children who want to pioneer to really, really support them. I'll see if I can turn my video on. I just wanted to just share with you what Elohim felt. Um, hi. <laughs> so nice to see your faces. <laughs> um, she contacted me on Facebook about a year ago and I didn't think she would remember me. She used to come to children's classes and she used to sit there in silence. And she never used to sing, she never used to speak, she just used to look up with her big brown eyes. And she was this beautiful, beautiful little girl. She was stunning, wasn't she, Mossy? And I used to wonder, as a 17 year old on my year of service, I used to think, am I making any difference in this, in this child's life? Am I making any difference? Is it having any impact? On, on her and on and on um, and on who you know on, on her on her faith or anything, she contacted me a, a year and a half, a year ago and she said um, and I, I wrote back to her and I said I'm really surprised you remembered me 
And you know what she said? She said, I used to come to that children's class that you used to run, Ellie. And she said, how could I forget you? She said, I used to sit there and I used to look at you and I used to say to myself, one day I'm going to become her. I'm going to be her. And she said, now I'm you. I've become you. <laughs> and it really, for me, it impacted, you know, people ask me all the time now, how does the children's class, um, running a children's class, how is that going to change the world? Because there are millions of Carmen's <laughs> mm. across yeah. the globe, you know? And it's that she now has completely turned her life around. And then she told me the story of what happened to her and what was happening to her when we were in Croydon and why she left Croydon and how, what path her life took and how she became that girl that she wanted to be. But it started in that children's class. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just, I just want to say um, to everybody that there is this beautiful Persian girl who come from fine, who <laughs> arrive at our little old house and then um, stay there. At first she didn't like it because we were not there, but when we came back she fit in and she was the one, Ellie was the one responsible for teaching the prayers to the, uh, to the Alawinas, to the Baha'i community. And it was very interesting, thank you, Ali, that three o'clock in the morning, they all come for dawn prayers. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah. Dawn prayers at three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. It was Knocking on the door. Life, Mossy. Honestly, <laughs> friends, so many people um, tell the youth that, that talk to me now about going on a year of service, and their families, don't do it. What about your studies? What about this? What about that? It was the best year of my life. And lots of people told my parents the same things. They told them not to send me to the middle of nowhere. And that <laughs> they told them that I'd end up going the wrong direction. I'd end up, things would happen to me. Why would they send me? If you know of anybody who wants to do a year of service, this is the thing that's going to make their life firm mm. they're going to find the faith for themselves encourage them encourage the parents encourage it's so sad to see that um that when friends of people whose children want to go on a year of service don't encourage they tell them well what about your studies what about this what about that they'll get to their studies i got to my studies it, it, you know and they'll be blessed and their families will be blessed for supporting them. So I, I, I suggest that we send all the children now out to Chaney and Nettie. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. You're most welcome. We need you. <laughs> yes. Chaney and Nettie are doing the most wonderful job now after all these years returning there and they need help. And there is so many blessings out there. They need help. Yeah. Thank you, Steve and Mossy. Someone, and Halloween. Will, someone will come. Fine. <laughs> Good to see you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much to uh, Steve and Mossy for this last hour and the friends that you brought online. And uh, it was great to have Ellie come in there uh, at the end uh, to give that very moving story. And uh, Ellie, uh, you've, you've brought a connection to the beginning of this whole series. Um, it reminded me that uh, the friends of Claire and Hyde Dunn said, what are you doing going to Australia? Do you realize how far it is? Do you realize that you, your age and your lack of resource? And they went anyway. And now you've given a similar story uh, that uh, you know, people think about the limitations rather than the bounties. And these stories that we've heard today um, emphasize the, the blessings that come when people make that step, uh, moving out of comfort zone, uh, as Steve and Mossy have done, as Helen has done for so many years, and, and the other friends who came on to the session today. Steve and Mossy, we do have to bring it to an end, but I wonder if yes. you have any final uh, thoughts, final uh, comments uh, uh, to bring your presentation to a close. So, 
Thank you, Graham. Um, so <coughs> once you get the bug of pioneering, you can't get rid of it. For many years, my father asked me to return to Tonga, but I just couldn't leave Australia. And you know, um, the next phase now is the, it's, 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 you got it because we know we, we don't want to be selfish that we want to share with everybody that once you go to the pioneering, you will be blessed for the rest, you know, the rest of your lives. And, um, you know, we are about to leave uh, here because of my health and move into Catherine. So we got the back, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just... I just think that, um, that, that and, until you go pioneering, you haven't lived. Honestly, you, you have to put your hands in, in Baha'u'llah's hands. Yeah. And when you do that, the blessings and the pain become so good. <laughs> you, you go through a lot of suffering, but afterwards you realize, God, that was such a bounty, that mm -hmm. suffering. You never realise it until you go pioneering, I don't think. Graham, can I just so much. Add one uh, Ellie, yes, you can have one last say, yes. <laughs> I remember when I came back from my year of service, from pioneering, first of all, I cried for six months. Because oh, wow. I missed my pioneering goal area so much. For six months, I cried. And I wasn't the same person anymore. I didn't fit in the same. My thinking had completely changed. And I remember one day I was washing the dishes in the kitchen and I noticed from the side of my eyesight, I noticed my father was watching me. And I turned to him and I said, what, what, you, what, what, what is it? <laughs> you know, like what? And he looked at me and he said, you're not the same girl that I sent away. You're a different person. And he was right. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right. Because something inside you changes. You, you, you attract blessings. And it sets you on a different path than you would have gone on had you not taken the risk. And I was petrified of going. I was really scared. But friends, encourage each other. Arise. Right now, the goal needs you. The house of justice needs you. And if there's friends that want to move, help them to arise. Fan their flame and help them to arise. It'll make a difference. Love you. Love Thank you, Ellie. Thank you, Graham. Can I just say something? Okay. Well, Halloween just wants to say something. Um, Ellie, even though we were small in your children's classes, <laughs> but you affected us. <laughs> Um, and I'm doing it now. Yeah, <laughs> I'm doing what you're doing, teaching the children. Well, she's you. So happy. <laughs> she's becoming you, Ellie. Mm. Oh, she's better than me. <laughs> Love, you, <Graham. laughs> Love you, Maddie and Ian. Thank you, Graham. Thank you so much, friends. Uh, I think the time has come for us to finish this session. I thank everybody for coming online and we look forward to having as many people as possible come online next week. Uh, we'll send the details along in an email. Thank you so much. Hello. 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 Hello.